My name is Simon Brown. I am not doing this evening's presentation. That honor goes to Nerina Fisser, or rather the honor, I suppose, is ours. Uh, Nerina, of course, of etfsa.co.za. Uh, we invited Nerina because Christy and I take the, I suppose we could call it perhaps the lazier response. We take one ETF and let it do the work. Nerina's going to come and look at a, what she calls proactive passive management of an ETF portfolio. Uh, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. We'll certainly have some time at the end of the presentation for questions. But with that, Nerina, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Wonderful to be here. I do miss the fact that we're not able to be together in person, but I also appreciate that this format allows many people that would not have been able to make it maybe to the physical JSE or even in Durban or Cape Town or whatever to, to join us here. So wonderful to be here with everyone. And I look forward to the engagement and certainly the questions um, at the end as well. So yes, as Simon says, proactive passive management. It sounds like a bit of a contradiction in terms. Um, sounds a little bit like what's this national intelligence and uh, general, uh, um, uh, you know, those sort of uh, comments. But um, yes, let's talk about what is proactive passive management. Got to start with a necessary disclaimer. You'll see also on several of my slides, I say this is not to be construed as, as advice. I'm using illustrative uh, sort of examples here and um, it's a discussion. It's certainly not advice. Some background about myself just to prove that I am as old as I look. Um, but yes, let's get straight into the idea of how to get proactive with your passive investments. I'm going to start with what is proactive passive management, just dig a little bit into that. And then we're going to talk about the three major steps of this process. The upfront design of your investment strategy, how to get intimate with what you have, how to actually figure out what do I have in my investment portfolio? What do I hold? And then we're going to go through a mind the gap exercise. How do we get from what we currently have to where we want to be or what we would like to hold in our portfolio. So that's really our format for the evening tonight. Word of warning right up front, this is going to be an Excel lent presentation. I hope it'll be excellent as well, but yes, um, this is at a more advanced level. I am going to be using a lot of examples where I use Excel. And really, I think for any serious investor who wants to be managing their own investments, um, I do recommend that if you're currently not proficient in Excel. There's a lot that you can do with paper and pen, but I really would recommend that you that you get close and personal and, and comfortable with using Excel. Um, I live in Excel most of the time. But right, let's get into proactive passive management. What do I mean with that? The proactive part of it is the design. It's really about that upfront design of what does my port desired portfolio strategy look like? And that desired portfolio really needs to match my investment goals, my investment objectives. And we're gonna go through some, some examples of how to do that. It also incorporates the identification of the appropriate investment instruments that I want to use. And I'm going to be using specifically ETFs as my examples. I am unashamedly biased in terms of ETFs, but of course, index tracker portfolios really is what we're talking about when we refer to this colloquially passively managed investment instruments. But there's also the proactive component of the conscious selection of which investment accounts will I be using? For example, is this gonna go into a retirement fund? Is this gonna go into a tax-free account? Is this gonna be my discretionary portfolio? And we're gonna go through those options and identify when and where and how each of these would be most appropriate. The passive side of things really comes in terms of the implementation then of your proactive design that you've done because we implement the strategy using so-called passively managed building blocks. And I know that you said an ETF stands for an exchange traded fund, but I'm going to tell you that for me, the E really is about the efficiency. Yes, of course, cost efficiency that we get through you ETFs, but the efficiency in terms of being able to buy exposure to a whole region, to a whole asset class, to a whole group of investments with a single transaction. The T in ETF for me is all about the transparency, that you know exactly what you are invested in. ETF issuers have to disclose on a daily basis exactly what is held in that ETF fund. So the transparency is absolutely superb. And if I want to get close and personal with my investments and know what I'm invested in, there's nothing better than an ETF to do just that. And the F, 
Well, the F for me is about the flexibility. The fact that they are liquid, that they are easily accessible, that you've got guaranteed liquidity through the, the market maker on the JSD, and why we refer to ETFs as the democratic investment choice is that, of course, because they are exchange traded, it means that everybody pays the same cost price, the same expense ratio. There's no different class structures or fee structures. So for, for some good democratic, democratic re reasons, I also love love my ETFs. But let's just talk a little bit about this idea of passive versus active. We so often hear this, and it's such a misnomer, this idea. So I want to just dig into a little bit of what aspects of my strategy is going to be passive and what aspect is active. So let's start with our building blocks. Our building blocks is really the individual instruments or funds that I'm going to put into my investment. And when I talk about a passive building block, I'm talking here about an index tracking portfolio. And I'm going to use ETFs as my, as my example of index tracking portfolios, even though, of course, we do get unit trusts also that are index tracking portfolios. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to assume and and work on the basis that my passive building blocks are index tracking portfolios and are ETFs. Active building blocks, actively managed building blocks, really talk about actively managed portfolios. And again, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to refer to these as unit trusts. We do have some actively managed ETFs as well. And as I said, we do have some passively managed or index tracking unit trusts as well. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say passive versus active in this example is going to talk about ETFs versus unit trusts. But that's just one aspect of the passive versus active. The second aspect of it is how do I manage these different building blocks? Do I actively choose them and put them into my portfolio or is it actually quite a passive stance? So you'll see I've got a four quadrant sort of matrix up on the screen. There's the one quadrant, quadrant that says I'm going to manage active building blocks, in other words, unit trusts, quite actively, which means I'm going to be regularly reviewing these, changing them, buying, selling, doing all sorts of things, actively managing my portfolio of unit trusts. On the other side of the equation, I could also be managing my passive building blocks quite passively. So this would be where I have a strategy where I've got a strategic sort of allocation in terms of what are the basic ETFs that I want to be exposed to in my portfolio. I choose them, I implement them, and I don't really do much in terms of it after that. And although that's a great idea for the majority of us, as especially as we are still building up assets over time, we're building up our wealth, we do need to have some activity in our portfolio. This would be a buy and hold sort of passive portfolio. Um, and, and so not really really practical in many instances. The sad thing is that probably the majority of retail money in South Africa is a case of managing active building blocks passively. In other words, people choose an active unit trust, uh, um, actively managed unit trust, on some arbitrary basis. It could be because of past performance. It could be because it gets sold to them by an advisor. It could be because their friend has it, whatever the reason might be. But they invest in an actively managed fund, and then they leave it, and they don't revisit that. Even though the underlying fund might change, even though the, 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 the premise behind the performance of it might change over time, they don't do anything about it. And you'll see that that, for me, is one of the worst ways ways that one can actually manage funds. What we're going to be focusing here on tonight is how to manage passive building blocks actively. And so when we look at this quadrant, you'll see that from a cost perspective, the more activity we have in a, in a, in a portfolio, in other words, if we are managing active building blocks actively, that's going to be our highest cost structure. If we are managing passive building blocks passively, that's going to be our lowest cost structure. And those are the two somewhere in between. So why would we sort of vary between these? Well, when you look at the, at the strategy behind how actively you manage your portfolio, so if you are managing it relatively actively, that increases the potential, I, I emphasize the potential to maximize returns. If you are appropriately selecting on an active basis your investments, you could improve performance in that. 
The other side of the equation would be that the, the type of building blocks that you're using, so whether you are using actively managed building blocks or passively managed building blocks, talks about minimizing risk. And here I define risk as my tracking error to my strategy. How far am I away from my strategy, from my intended exposure that I want to have in my portfolio? And using passively managed building blocks such as ETFs, we can minimize that risk, uh, that, uh, that um, um, risk quite substantially. So when we look at this concept of proactive asset management, we're really talking about putting together multi-asset class portfolios, also called balanced funds often in South Africa, but multi-asset class portfolios. And we do so on a rules basis. We've got some rules that define what do we put in, what do we take out, how do we do it? And we, on a modular basis, construct portfolios. I love to think of myself as somebody who plays with Lego all the time because I've got all these different Lego pieces, you know, square red ones, round green ones, rectangular blue ones. And I can take from the, the box of Lego pieces the bits and pieces that suit my investment objective or my client's investment objective. And when we look at the different types of blocks that we might have, you can see that there's a vast array of types of building blocks. I've just listed some of them there. You know, anything from inflation linker fixed income to infrastructure alternative investments or high dividend paying equities or commodities or emerging market international exposure and the list goes on. For simplicity's sake, I am going to focus tonight on five major investment asset classes when we talk about designing our desired investment strategy. And the five broad asset classes, as I've shown you just now, that's certainly not a comprehensive or a complete set of, of asset classes. But this is a very good starting point for a well-diversified multi-asset class portfolio. The first one would, for obvious reasons, be equities. Why is equities the first building block in a portfolio? We are talking here about investment strategies. So we are talking about things that are for the longer term, and we are looking to invest in assets that has the potential to beat inflation over time. We want to grow our capital faster than inflation. A long way, we might be getting some nice dividends, which is quite nice, but we want to beat inflation over the long term. And we need to understand and appreciate that there will be some variability. There will be some volatility. The ability for equities to actually outperform inflation over the longer term means that we must be prepared to accept lower performance, drops in prices and losses in capital over the shorter term period. That's my first asset class. The second one would be interest-bearing asset classes. And we're going to take, go into some detail of what each of these asset classes um, in, include. But interest-bearing is, as the name suggests, instruments and assets that really give you some interest. So that is a form of income or a form of yield that you would get, which then therefore also assists with stabilizing your returns. Because returns typically would be capital gains or losses plus the income yield that you would get, the interest yield. And in the case of interest-bearing assets, relatively small capital component, relatively large income component, interest-bearing component. Our third asset class then is real estate or property. And this includes, by the way, direct property, investment property that you might own, that you are renting out as a form of income. Now, for me, property really is a bit of a hybrid between equities and interest bearing because it comes with characteristics and aspects of both of these asset classes. So real estate or property, a very distinct and separate and different asset class from both equities as well as interest bearing asset classes. My fourth asset class is physical commodities. And the reason why I include physical commodities, even though they don't have any payoff, so they don't have any dividends, they don't give you any income, they don't give you any interest. And that's often a criticism that is leveled against physical commodities. So people would often argue and say, why would you have physical commodities in an investment portfolio if it doesn't have any potential for any income that it can give you. And the two reasons why I would have, it, have them in there really is the fact that they do have a very different payoff profile than many of your other asset classes have. I often refer to, for example, gold as that thing in your portfolio that zigs when everything else zags. It is a form of a hedge against the other type of asset classes that we have. But the second reason is becoming more and more relevant as we move through a world which has been flooded with 
with easy and cheap money. The ability to actually invest in something that is physical, something that has that cannot just be created at random, just printed by the central bank printing presses. So the value of a physically backed, to physically underpinned um, um, asset class is very important. And then my final asset class, cash. Just plain good old cash. Cash to provide liquidity in a portfolio, but cash that will also, at least on a nominal basis, provide you some form of capital guarantee. It is a very important component of a well-diversified investment portfolio and why I include it very much as a distinct separate asset class in my portfolio. Great. So let's go into each of these five asset classes and say, what are we talking about and what type do we actually have in terms of that? So what, how much, where, how, where do I start, Narina? Please help me through this. So let's start with equities. And I'm going to give you some indicative ranges, sort of proportion of a portfolio that I believe one should be looking at in terms of this. And you'll see for equity, I've got a very, very broad range. Somewhere between 25% and 80% of your entire investment asset base should be invested in equities for the simple reason that we are looking for that inflation beating capital growth. The lower end would be relevant if you've got a shorter investment horizon or if you have a specific higher income need from your portfolio. So later on in your life, when you're already living off your investments and so on, you would typically have a lower equity component and a higher income component in your portfolio. But even when you are at your most risk seeking, you'll see that I will never recommend 100% in an equity portfolio. I take it up to say a maximum of 80%. Where would I place those equities? Well, whether you like it or not, our home market is South Africa. And this is the recommended advice for anyone anywhere in the world. You should always, your first investment should always be in your home market because ultimately that is where you live. That is where you spend money. That is where your, your um, living expenses is linked to the inflation rate, to the growth, to the everything of that country that you're in. So for my home market, somewhere between 10 and 40% of my overall portfolio. Bear in mind, these are numbers of the overall portfolio, not of the equity portfolio, the overall portfolio. In the case of my developed markets, here I would like to see at least a 10% exposure possibly up to 30% exposure in terms of developed markets. The reason why it's a relatively high number compared to my 40% of my home market is that, of course, South Africa represents less than 1% of the investable universe of the globe. So we will never want to have all of our money just in South Africa. We have to expose our money to more of the world. And developed markets is just one component of that. Emerging markets is a growing component of that. And you might say to me, but Narina, we are in South Africa. We are in an emerging market. Why should I invest in emerging markets? Well, for the same reason as we all want to invest in the rest of the world, South Africa is a relatively small component of the emerging market universe, depending on how you look at it, probably just somewhere between 5 and 7%. So there's a big emerging market world out there that we definitely want to bring into our portfolios. And you'll also see that in terms of maximum exposure, I'm putting emerging markets at, on par with developed markets because we find that that is where the future lies. The future lies in, in our emerging markets and that's where the growth in large part is also going to come from. So I often say to people, if you want to invest for the past, invest in developed markets. But if you want to invest for the future, invest in emerging markets. We'll come back to that. My final category under equities would be some special interest. This would be sector-specific ETFs or theme-specific ones. And this is all the rage at the moment. Technology. Technology is just such a hot theme and trend at the moment. We've got things like biotechnology. We've got healthcare. We've got consumer. We've got clean energy. All sorts of themes and trends. And so you might say to me, but you know, that's where all the action is. Surely I should be putting all of my money into the technology sector. I mean, have you seen what the NASDAQ has done in the last six Six to, six to 12 months. But you'll see that I limit my exposure for these special interest sort of sectors such as technology to a relatively modest 20%. And that is because a lot of these trends tend to come to go through cycles also. There's a time and a place for some of these and then it tends to fade away. And if it doesn't fade away, well, then it actually becomes 
the prominent broad-based market. So then you will see that reflected, as we already see with technology, being strongly reflected in both our developed and our emerging market um, uh, exposures. So you don't need to go and buy that only in your special interest. You'll be getting a lot of that in your broad-based um, market ETFs and, and indices anyway. So that's my equity exposure. Let's then move on to the interest bearing component. Now from the interest bearing perspective, I would say that you don't have to have interest bearing investments, you could have nothing. Certainly if you're young, if you're starting out, you've got a very, very long term investment horizon. There's no real reason why you have to have interest bearing in your portfolio. But you could have as much as 60% of your portfolio in interest bearing assets, especially once again, if you are older, you've got a shorter term time horizon, you've got a bigger need for income from your components. So a nice broad category in terms of that. South African bonds, once again, my home market, and one that also happens to offer some really good real interest rates globally. So as much as 40% of my portfolio could theoretically be in South African bonds. What about preference shares? Now, preference shares is quite an interesting hybrid also, because the underlying investment is not a bond per se, it is, it is um, preference dividends, preference shares in a company, but the interest that is paid out, although the income that is paid out of that is linked to interest rates. And so it's paid out as a dividend, and I'm now sort of sidetracking a little bit here, but from a tax perspective, in other words, the treatment of the dividends that you receive from preference shares versus the interest that you receive from other interest-bearing investments is different. And that is why in some portfolios, preference shares could be a very, very good option for your interest-bearing exposure. You could also have things like currency notes. Now, here I'm talking about getting some global exposure, some RAND hedge exposure through effectively very simple interest bearing investments. This would be like literally holding some of your money in US dollars or in pounds or in euros, for example. And so these currency notes is a great way for you to bring some additional RAND hedge or offshore, effective offshore exposure into your portfolio. Global bonds, of course, would be a more specific exposure to those global markets, but then you also got to take the underlying conditions of that international bond market into consideration, whereas in the case of the currency notes, it's much more just a reflection of the currency rather than any sort of major interest that you're going to be receiving in, in terms of those. So that's my interest bearing asset cost. What about real estate then, or property? And as I said, um, because this includes physical property, direct property as well, this could be as much as 50% of your portfolio. I'm sure that many of you that are on the webinar tonight might already be holders of investment portfolios where you actually hold investment properties which you rent out as a form of income. And therefore your direct property exposure, which I'm assuming now would be in South Africa, could be a relatively high number. It could be as high as 40%. But I caution very strongly against only having a property portfolio, because I see a lot of people that come in with this idea that property is, is a sort of a sign of, of wealth and, and assets and, and owning physical and real sort of assets and, and, and then have a dominant portfolio just of property, direct property. And we're going to go into why that is not the only investment that you should have. You could, of course, also invest in listed property shares and those that we've got in South Africa certainly doesn't just give you exposure to South Africa, the, the country in terms of where those properties are housed. But this really talks about properties, um, property companies, REITs, real estate investment trust companies that are listed on the JSE, but provide you exposure to other direct properties. Similarly, you might have your global listed property sector, and you'll see for both of those, I say anywhere between zero and 20% would be appropriate and suitable in a portfolio, depending on your requirements. What about our last two asset classes, the others that we have? So physical commodities for me is something that could be as much as 20% of your overall portfolio. Once again, it's not something that you have to have. And maybe in the early days when your portfolio is relatively small, um, you might find that, that the other investments that you have crowd out to the ability to invest in physical commodities. But it's a good one to have as a target to start working towards in terms of your portfolio to bring in that good diversification benefit that physical commodities can give you in your portfolio. 
and then cash, good old cash. And do you see that I don't say that a possible minimum is 0%? I say you should always have probably at least 5% in cash. Maybe if you've got a really, really large asset base, 5% is too much, but that would really be if we're talking about several millions of rands of portfolios. And we're going to go into some of this, this detail later on as well. Great, so now I've got my basic portfolio framework in terms of my, my five basic asset classes, and you'll see I've identified here the minimum and maximums that I've explained there, and I've given you each of the categories that we've just gone through with exactly those some same minimum and maximum amounts. And now we're going to start going into how do I now design my own portfolio? What do I want in terms of my portfolio? And what I've done is I've already allocated sort of my personal preferred allocations to this. So let's look at some of that. And I'm just going to take them from the top down. I'm going to have 10% of my portfolio in South African equities, my home market. Another 10% in developed market equities. And I'm still very much focused on the future. So for me, I want to have 15% of my exposure to emerging market equities, obviously other emerging markets other than South Africa. 5% of my portfolio, I'm going to put into special interest or sector specific investments in terms of my portfolio. When it then comes to interest bearing accounts, 10% in bonds, I've got 5% in global, in South African bonds, sorry, 5% in global bonds, 5% in currency notes, and at this stage, I don't have any preference shares in my portfolio design. Direct property. So I own an investment property, not my primary home, but one that does represent a, an investment for me. And so I'm comfortable with 20% of my overall portfolio being exposed or, or held in my direct property investment. Because I've got 20% already there in direct property in South Africa, I'm not going to add any more listed property in South Africa to my portfolio, but I've got 5% in my global property that I'm targeting in terms of my portfolio design. 10% in precious metals and 5% in cash. And that adds up then to a portfolio design, an initial one for me of 40% in equities, 20% in interest-bearing investments, 25% in real estate or property, 10% physical commodities, and 5% in cash. And this is where I want to start. This is my desire. This is what I would like my investment portfolio to look like. The next step is that I now I've got to say, well, okay, well, how am I going to give life to this portfolio design? What are the types of ETFs that I can consider for inclusion in my portfolio? So let's look at the equity components again. So when I look at my South African equity exposure, I'm really only interested here in the broad-based equity market. And you'll see I do much the same also for the developed and emerging markets also. I just want the vanilla broad-based stuff, whether it's a top 40 or a Swix 40 or a top 50 or whatever, it's really neither here nor there, and I'm not going to split hairs about which individual one, but you'll see I'm not including any of the sector-specific ones or some of the sec um, uh, thematic ones or, or um, factor-based ones, just good old broad-based market cap-weighted um, equity exposure for my, for my South African exposure. As I say, similarly for developed markets, MECI world, by the way, despite its name, it is actually not the whole world. It's just the developed markets in the world. Many people feel that the S&P 500 gives for them sufficient overall developed market exposure because it includes so much in, um, investment that American companies have done elsewhere in the world. I don't quite hold that view, but that might be good enough for you in terms of your choice. There's, of course, the Global 1200 Equity um, Index also that one can do. That does include some emerging markets. I think it's currently around about 7%, so a relatively modest amount there. But that would be sort of typically the type of indices and exposures that you can consider for your broad-based developed market exposure. What about emerging markets? Well, go to the Emerging Market ETF or the Emerging Market Index. And, of course, more recently, we now also have a China-specific one. And the reason why I say that that might also be an option, although it wouldn't be my preference, I would only add China in addition to the emerging market one. But for many of you, once again, with China being the second largest economy in the world after the US, and most likely in the next five years will become the largest economy in the world, you might want to have a lot more specific exposure to China. That's a personal choice for you.
my special sector or, um, or theme sort of uh, trend type of investments. As I mentioned, they could be things like tech, the NASDAQ, the fourth industrial revolution, those type of, of indices. They could be dividend specific indices. Maybe you are specifically looking for more income in your portfolio, in which case some of the dividend ETFs would be appropriate. Um, the momentum exposure might be a very good one if you, if you still have a higher risk appetite and you're prepared to sort of ride with the momentum. So those are some that I could consider. What about the interest bearing side? Well, from South African bonds, I've got a choice between government bonds or inflation linked bonds. My preference is for the government bonds. I don't believe that inflation is a problem or will be anytime soon, not only in South Africa, but certainly nowhere in the world. So there's no need for me really to include inflation linkers in my portfolio design at this stage. If I was going to use preference shares, well, the pref tracks, the call shares pref tracks one is the only one we have available in South Africa. We've got three different types of currency notes that we can consider, dollar, pound, euro. And in terms of global bonds, well, we've got some developed market global bond um, ETFs that we can consider. And then we've got some that also specifically is just US global bonds. What about my property exposures? Well, of course, my direct property exposure, I'm not going to do through an ETF. That is my, my physical property that I own. Um, if I'm going to list a property exposure, I've given you the share codes there of three different options. They are somewhat different, so it's worthwhile lifting the hood, looking under the kimono and see what's going on in terms of that. And in terms of the global property exposure, there's the global REIT, the Real Estate Investment Trust, and then there's also so the global property 40 index that one can buy in two different ETFs. So those I could consider. What about physical commodities? Gold for me is number one in terms of one that I would consider in this particular asset class. But of course, there are other precious metal ETFs also available, platinum, palladium, rhodium we've got available. And then we also have some commodity notes. So we have the ability to incorporate other types of commodities into our, um, into our portfolios energy commodities like oil ETN, for example, or agriculture commodities, wheat, corn, these sort of things. So those would be available for consideration. As far as cash is concerned, there is a cash ETF. The New Funds Tracy attracts a three-month cash um, rate that you've got there. But for most of us, our cash probably would just be held in an ordinary bank savings account or maybe a now that I've got my possible ETFs that I can look at, I just want to introduce one more concept to you here, because many of you, I'm sure, have heard the statement that diversification is the only free lunch in town, and I certainly agree with that. But I want to warn you that you must be careful of diversification. I hear you sort of say, what? What is diversification? Well, diversification is when you hold many different investments. So you think you're very diversified, because look how many different things I hold but not realizing that the underlying holdings are so similar that actually your portfolio suffers from these unintended consequences. You are very concentrated or very, there's a lot of duplicates in your portfolios. So true diversification doesn't lie in the number of investment instruments that I hold in my portfolio, but rather how different those investment instruments are and why it's very important for us to really know what's going on. I'm just going to use three examples here for you of some of these duplication or, or unintended consequences. The NECI world and the S&P 500, for example, or for that matter, any other broad-based US market index. And the reason for that is that the MSCI world index consists 65% of the US already. So can you see that if you combine the MSCI world with an S&P 500 or the MSCI US or, or one of those indices, two thirds of those two ETFs are exactly the same. So you're not getting any diversification, even though the one is an S&P index and the other one is an MSCI index, still very little diversification. Similarly, you might look at something like the S&P 500 and the MSCI US. And again, they sound so different and many people don't realize that the MSCI US is actually the top 600 companies in the US, whereas the S&P 500 is the top 500. And yes, it's 100 extra companies, but quite frankly, the proportion that that extra 100 make of the MSCI US index is so small that you're actually really just duplicating. So beware of these duplicates that you're holding in your portfolio. Another example is that on the South African market, our top 40 or 640 type indices and the INDI, the industrial index, 
And why that unintended sort of duplication that we've got there? Well, it is because of the size of NASPERS, not even adding process in it, just purely looking at NASPERS. NASPERS, which is, um, is, is over 31%, I think at last check, over 31%, so almost a third of the industrial index, and it's got a similar sort of exposure in terms of your SWIX index. Top 40, it's about 22% or so, and SWIX 40, over 30%. So by combining those two, you are really duplicating. And I often see people, for example, having a top 40 ETF and the RESI and the FINI and the INDI. And now they think they diversified. But actually, if you add the RESI and the FINI and the INDI together, you're pretty much back at the top 40. So having four, those four different ETFs in your portfolio is not giving you any more diverse, diversification. It's giving you diversification, not diversification. So very important here, check the fact sheets, check those top 10 holdings, understand what you're holding and what you're investing in. Check the sector or the regional exposure. And if needs be, go and stick the numbers into a spreadsheet, go back to that favorite of mine, Excel, and actually get to the numbers and see what am I actually holding through these, board for these specific ETFs that I hold. So I've now gone and I've selected out of my list of possible ETFs, I've given some examples there of what I would consider for my portfolio that I could possibly use. And so by now I have a portfolio design and I've got some ETF options that I want to do. So, right, so now surely I can go and implement. Well, not quite yet, because which investment account am I going to do these investments in? Remember, that was our third proactive step that we needed to investigate. Now, there are four main account types that we can consider. These are retirement savings accounts, and I use the word pre-retirement savings there because there is also post-retirement savings, which is beyond the scope sort of, of today's discussion, which is things like your living annuities, but pre-retirement savings would be RA investments, pension, provident fund, and so on. The second one, is, of course, is our favorite tax-free investment accounts, just shortened word TFSA that I'm using there. I also have the ability for a discretionary account, a discretionary portfolio. And then, as I mentioned, my pure bank savings account or my money market account that I'm going to have. Those are my four main account types that I can deal with. Direct or physical property, of course, would be something separate that I would still have there. And just to highlight, there are, there are other options, of course, as well, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. For example, you might be holding some crypto assets. You might be involved in a stock fell or an investment club. And so you might have some investments through some joint account also of some sort. So yes, they, um, you might have a, an individual stock broking portfolio in which you've got individual shares, for example. So there are other options. I'm going to focus on those first four tonight in our examples here. So what are some of the considerations around these different account types? Well, when we look at retirement savings, it's very important that we appreciate that typically these are managed on a pooled basis. In other words, all of the members of that RA fund, all of their investments are put together in one big pot and it is managed by an external manager. It also has to be Regulation 28 compliant, so there are some limits in terms of how it can be invested. But for you as the investor, the key thing here is that you're going to have very limited control over the choice of those underlying investments. You're just really going to be at the receiving end of what is held in your retirement annuity fund. So yes, you need to know what's in there, but understand that you don't really have the ability to change that all that much. Tax-free accounts, great. You can certainly have some choice there in terms of what you want to do there. There are some limits. It's got to be CIS, so Collective Investment Scheme or Unit Trust ETFs that you use in there. But really, we want to focus in our tax-free accounts on investments that would have the highest potential tax implications. So things that pay high interest or dividends, for example, because we want to avoid that dividend withholding tax of 20%. Things that over time has got the potential for the biggest capital gains because we don't want to pay that dreaded capital gains tax. So that's the type of investments I'm going to go stick into my tax-free account. My discretionary account is the one that I use for what I call my completion strategy. This is the one where I've got full freedom in terms of what to invest in, how much, when, where, how, whatever. So I can make up in that one anything and everything that I can't do anywhere else. My cash account is, of course, just the cash account. That's where my emergency funds and so on is going to be or any cash holdings that I've got for the purposes of, of liquidity and being able to, to make use of investment opportunities. And then, of course, that direct physical property. And I promised we would come back to this idea. And the, the reason why I say that 
one should never have all of your investments in physical property. And part of that is the low liquidity. You know, when you need to actually start um, uh, materializing some of the, the asset value that you're holding that, you cannot go and sell just three of the bricks of the house that you own to go and buy bread and milk. You either sell the entire house or nothing at all. So it's chunky. It's a big transaction. It comes with high turnover costs. I don't know when last any of you bought a property or sold a property, but not only the, the you know, sort of the commissions that you've got to pay, but also these, the, the duties and the taxes and so on. It is a very, very chunky investment. So it has a great role to play, but never put all of your investments just into physical property. So the next part of our presentation tonight is how to know and to understand what you actually have and what you hold in your portfolio. Because we've now done our design, so I know what I want to have. But what do I have at the moment and how do these two reconcile with one another? So I want to try and understand what do I actually hold in all of my different investment accounts? And this is where I'm really now going to start working in my Excel because I need to do an inventory list. I want to start and say for starters, what accounts do I have? Before I even look at what's inside the accounts, what accounts do I have? So I'm using a, just an illustrative example here. So let's say I've got a retirement savings account in there. I've got an ETFSIRA fund account and the current value of that is a million rand. I also have a tax-free investment account with ETFSA and my current value in that one is 200,000 rand. I then have an ETFSA investor hub account. So my discretionary account and the current value of that, 450,000 rand. I'm holding 350,000 Rand in a money market fund, my bank savings, my cash holdings that I've got. And I have an investment property, not by primary home. And I've got the net asset value of that at 500,000 Rand, which is really the market value of that property minus the outstanding bond. So that's why that's the net asset value of this investment. So I now know I've got these five, call them accounts that I've got. So now let's start seeing if we can, I, can I figure out what's inside of them. So you see, I'm now back to my spreadsheet where I got my different asset classes and my different categories. And I've now created a little pot for each of my accounts. So I've got five different pots sitting here. And there I've already populated what is the value of each of those accounts. My million in my RA, 200,000 in the TFSA, et cetera, et cetera. So I now know these are my accounts that I hold. And now I've got to start figuring out, well, what's actually inside of each of these? So the first two is very simple. The bank savings account or the money market account, well, that's just cash. That's all it is. The direct property, well, that is what it is. It is just direct property. So very easy for me to now go and populate those. So I can say in my cash account, well, 100% of that account is in cash. 100% of my direct property is in direct property. And you can see how that then calculates for me that the amount of money that I hold in cash, according to this, is 350000 The amount I hold there, 500000 Very simple exercises. Let's now go to the next one. So what about my RA fund? Now, remember I said this is a pooled investment. It's managed by an external manager. So I don't know what goes into it because I didn't choose it. So that means I've got to go to the fact sheet to go and find out what is sitting inside that RA fund. So I hold the um, uh, ETFSA RA Wealth Enhancer portfolio. So there's the first page of that, um, that fact sheet in particular. And I'm interested in this bit that says actual portfolio holding. So let's zoom in on that and say, right, what do I actually hold in this? And you see that it gives me a detailed breakdown of everything that is held in that portfolio from the cash 4.2%, the new funds, Gavi ETF 14.4%, all the way down to my physical commodities, gold and palladium, totaling 10.4% in terms of my holdings there. So I can now take these holdings from the fact sheet and I can now go and populate my spreadsheet with this. So there's my 14.4% in bonds. There's my 4.2% in cash. There's my 10.4% in precious metals, et cetera. And it then calculates that for me that if I have a million rand in my RA and 4.2% of that is held in cash, it means I'm holding 42,000 rand in cash in that portfolio. Similarly, I'm holding 144,000 rands in South African bonds in that portfolio. And you can see how it calculates me based on those percentage holdings in the fact sheet and the value of my portfolio. It actually tells me how many rands, how many rands do I hold in each of those categories in my asset classes? What about my tax-free account? Well, 
I can go and look at my investment account. And there's my investment account for my tax-free investment. All the way from 11.9% in terms of my One Invest Global REIT Index Feeder Fund, all the way down to 26% in my Satrix MSCI World. So again, I can go and take those numbers and populate it in here. There's my 11.9% in my Global REIT, my listed property. Multiplied by the 200,000 Rand that I've got, it tells me that I'm holding 23,800 Rand in listed global property in my TFSA. And exactly the same is done for the other holdings as well. Finally, the discretionary account, exactly the same as the tax-free account. Look at your investment account, see what you hold, and go and populate the percentages. It'll calculate the RAND amounts for you. And now I've got my whole portfolio in one aggregate to actually see what do I have. But of course, there's still one missing step here. I've actually got to add it all up because knowing what my aggregate portfolio is all about, I've now added a total column in here, which is the sum of the RAND amounts of each that I've got here. So the 85,200 Rand that I've got in global bonds, there's 65,000 Rand and 20,200 Rand over there. And you'll see for all of them across that, that's how I come to the total in terms of the RAND amounts, which makes up my two and a half million Rand asset base. And the pie chart, the percentage holding, the proportional holdings are then literally just 253,800 divided by the 2.5 million is 10.2% of my overall portfolio. And you can see how in this way it calculates for me exactly what am I holding in my current aggregate, my all over portfolio together. And this then brings us to the mind the gap exercise that says, okay, that's great. I've now designed what I want. I know what I have, how do these two compare? How do I know what is the gap between these two things? And so I can now put side by side my desired portfolio that I designed and my actual portfolio as it stands now. And now I can see, oops, they're not quite the same. So let's look and see where are some of the big gaps. So, ooh, I can see uh, I'm a bit short on emerging market equities. I need a bit more EM equities. Um, ooh, I probably need a bit more global bonds as well. I'm a bit short there and so on. And oops, I'm holding way too much cash. Okay, way too much there. I need to do something about it. And so a different way of, of doing the calculation is I can literally go and say, what is the difference between what I want to hold and what I am currently holding? And this is gonna give me an indication whether I should be buying or selling. So I'm certainly not going to start meddling with a small amount and, and fiddling around with that and incurring all sorts of transaction costs around it. But some of these big ones, I can certainly look at that. And so I know that I've got to deploy some of my cash. I'm definitely holding way too much cash. So these are nice 267,000 Rand that I need to deploy. And I'm probably going to use, you know, 63,000 of that to buy global property. And I'm going to use almost 40,000 of that to buy gold, global bonds. And so I can go on. And you can see how having done this mind the gap exercise, it now starts giving me guidance in terms of what do I need to do? What do I need to implement? Do you see that I have not once looked at performance of any of these assets? I've not looked at any of that type of information. I'm focusing specifically here on what do I want to need from my portfolios and what do I have and how do I make sure that I minimize that gap? In other words, I am completely immune from what's happening in that noisy news world out there. We are so confronted with news flow all the time and it creates the sense of urgency that I've got to do something about it. But the only thing that you should do is the things that are indicated for you in your mind, the gap exercise to, to, to fill those gaps. That's where you take action in the portfolio. So by all means, consume the noisy news for the entertainment value that it has. But please don't think that that should drive the action that you take in your investment portfolio. So let's think about where can I actually go and make these sort of changes in my portfolio? Well, can I do something about that money that's sitting in the money market account, that cash account? Yes, very easily. It's cash. It's sitting there. I can go and take it and I can go and spend it. Can I do something about that physical investment property? Uh, no, not likely. I can't sell the three bricks. So that is what it is. And I've got to leave it like that for the time being. What about my RA fund? Now, remember, I said that you don't have control over how that underlying is invested. So at best, you can add more money into your RA account, but you can't control the underlying allocation in terms of it. 
By contrast, the tax-free investment account, you can change the holdings, you can do some things in there, but you are limited or constrained by the amount of money that you can put in there. And depending on how big or small your portfolio is, that might not really give you all that much to play with. You know, in my case, it was 267,000 Rand that I needed to invest, way more than what I can do in my tax-free account. So my discretionary account in my case is going to be the account in which I need to really go and implement most of this completion strategy that I want to follow. And that brings me really to the when. When do I go through this exercise? So I'm now going to assume that I've already got my, uh, my design portfolio, that I've already got a portfolio as I presented it here tonight. And so once a year, it's a great idea to go through your annual planning exercise. And the reason why I like doing it in January is not just because we do a lot of sort of planning. I know our January 2020 planning did not quite pan out quite so well. But the point is that January is a good time because it's also just before the end of the tax year. So one of the first things that you want to identify during January and February is have I maximized the tax opportunities that's there? Have I maximized my contributions to my tax-free account? Have I maximized the contributions to my retirement to savings, to my ability and to what's appropriate for me given my age? Have I made use of tax harvesting opportunities in my discretionary portfolio? Sco a topic that is beyond the scope of what we're discussing here tonight, but January is all about assessing the tax implications of our portfolio folios and see if there's any changes that we need to make because of that. This is also a great time for you to revisit your portfolio design. Is it still fit for purpose? Have things changed? How have the headlines in your life changed? Not the headlines in the news, the headlines in your life. And does that require a change in your portfolio design? Are there new opportunities that you should consider? I mean, when we were in January 2020, we did not have the option of investing in China directly on the JSE, but now we do. Do we need to bring some of those into consideration in our portfolio design? And that's also the time that we then do the Mind the Gap exercise, that we look at this and we say, let's see if we can identify opportunities where we need to rebalance the portfolio, maybe making use of some of those tax harvesting opportunities, maximizing our tax-free contributions, moving money perhaps from your discretionary portfolio into your tax-free account if you have not maximized your contributions there. Similarly, moving money from your discretionary portfolio into your retirement annuity fund because you've not maximized the tax opportunities. So look at those opportunities at your annual review also. And then also set up your plan for the year ahead. So decide what your regular monthly contributions are going to be. Decide which account those needs to go into, what is going to my tax free, what's going to my RA, what's going to my discretionary account, what's going to my children's accounts or any other accounts. And then decide also on the allocation for those regular contributions, which asset classes, which ETFs. Set up those. Can you see that all of this was very proactive, what I did there? Implement it, set up those regular occurring investments, set up to go automatically into the appropriate investments that you've identified, and then go off and live your life and forget about this. Don't worry about it all the time, irrespective of what happens. There's also the opportunity that maybe you're lucky enough to get a bonus. So what happens if we get a bonus? Maybe a bonus at work, or maybe um, you inherit something, or maybe you sold an asset and you've got some money. This would be then represent an ad hoc or an additional lump sum contribution that we can make. And so this mind the gap exercise is then a very good one to go through because ideally what we want to try and do with that mind the gap exercise is as far as possible, never to sell anything that we already own. If we bought something that is appropriate for, for our portfolio, we don't want to necessarily sell it just because we are overweight to that particular exposure. You rather want to add more money into it and you're going to add to everything where you are underweight, everything where you are underrepresented in your portfolio. And so that's the best thing to do when it comes to these ad hoc lump sum contributions just to say, where am I short? Where am I? Where's the biggest gap in my mind, the gap exercise? And let me go and allocate the money to that. Again, do you hear that I'm not saying what has outperformed recently or what has underperformed recently or is the rand falling out of bed or did Trump open his mouth again or what? No, I look at my personal gap and I say, what do I need to do where I can control what I do and I make sure that my portfolio is fit for purpose for my requirements. So my general guidelines in terms of that, 
don't make changes to your portfolios because of market movements. It's one of the biggest um, challenges, I think, but one of the most valuable lessons. And the sooner you learn this in your investment life, the better. Do not, please, never, ever, ever select investments, whether those are asset classes or individual ETFs, on the basis of past performance. That is rear view mirror driving. You are going to have an accident sooner or later. Get away from past performance. Find strategies that allow you to make investment decisions based on, on things that do not involve past performance. And when there's a new listing, and we've had a couple recently, I mean, just yesterday, we got a new global bond ETF from Satrix. Last month, it was the China ETF. So often there's a new one and people get all excited about it and it's, oh, it's an IPO, I wanna participate, you know, should I buy it? All I'm asking you is, where does it fit into your plan? Does it fit into your plan? Great, that's the first positive tick then. Second question is, how are you going to fund it? Where is the money going to come from to participate in that new listing or to invest in it? And if it is appropriate, in my example, I was sitting on a lot of cash, so it's like, great, yes, I've got cash available, I can actually participate in that IPO or in that listing, or whatever the case might be. But don't get caught up in the hype of, oh, there's something new and, I, and the FOMO and I'm so worried I'm going to miss out on this one. Always first make sure that it actually fits your strategy because that's what you proactively designed up front. So my closing thoughts before we go to questions, there is no such thing as passive management. All investment decisions have an active component to it. It's about what we choose to do actively. So please, can we get away from this idea? That's why you see I'll always refer to passive in inverted commas because it's really, we can talk about index tracking, but not passive. Be very selective about where you apply active activity in your strategies. And you know, it's a very, very well known fact, not just suggested fact, a known fact, that trying to pick individual winners, winning stocks is a loser's game. And I recommend that if you haven't done it so yet, Charlie Ellis wrote the original, The Loser's Game back in the 1970s. Yes, 50 years ago already, Charlie Ellis wrote the, the Loser's Game and it was followed up by winning The Loser's Game. And if you haven't read it yet, I really believe that that's one of the seminal books of prudent and proper investment, investing to build wealth through time. And then finally, proactive investment management lies in the active design of your strategy that suits your objectives and you implement it using passively managed building blocks such as ETFs. And that's my story for you for today. And now I am very happy to hand back to Simon and say, fire away with whatever questions there might be. Thanks, Simon. Marina, thank you, that was I mean, always, kind of no one surprised, that was, that was absolutely brilliant. The, the question I am getting more than any, and it's a weird question, but they all want your spreadsheet. I thought that was going to come. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one a little bit. Yeah, you know what, Simon, I think, I think it is worthwhile. I think just to appreciate that um, I, I can share sort of the basic simple yeah. one as I had here and just to appreciate that once you start changing the spreadsheet, if you're going to add more columns for your different accounts, so you're going to add more rows for the different types of assets that you want in there, it might screw up the, the calculation. So I take no responsibility for, <laughs> for errors that creep into the, into the spreadsheet after you start fiddling with it, but happy to share it via you with the audience. Yeah, if, you, if you send it to me, I will stick it into the, the, the page, which the video and everything else will be on. But I do warn you, when Narina makes a, sp a spreadsheet and you fiddle it, you, you can break stuff. You can do astounding stuff to that. We, we got we got tons and tons of questions. We don't have time for all of them. Uh, Linda, we're like, yeah, we, we all start too late. No matter when you start, unless it's day one, it's too late. Uh, question, where to find the fact sheets for ETFs? Well, you can go to the individual issuers. I cheat. I go to ETFSA because they're there. It shows me all the TERS. It's nice and simple. You know, the other question that came through, you don't mention uh, total expense ratios. I suppose that's I mean, we're in this golden age where stuff's just so cheap. Maybe if yeah. you're looking at a top 40 and there are four of them, okay, then it matters. But, you know, splitting hairs for five points, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what, Simon? Absolutely. So, so tours and, and, and sort of the internal costs inside of an ETF really only become relevant for me when I need to choose between very, very similar 
ETFs within the same asset class. And, and I think a good example of where it is possibly worthwhile splitting hairs is if you look at the original US exposure that we had available on the JSE, which is mm -hmm. now the CBI ITRIX MECI USA ETF, 0.86% TR. You go and look yeah. at a, an S&P 500 ETF, and they are a lot cheaper for various reasons, one of them being that this is now new technology that can be used in terms of how these things are managed. There are much cheaper options available. Today, I was looking at a comparative between the five global bond ETFs that are available on the JSE. The twos vary between 0.3 and 0.45. Am I going to split hairs about 15 basis points in terms of one ETF in my portfolio? No, I've got better things to do with my life than that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I, you know, we, 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 back in the day when fees were three, four, five, six percent, it was a different game entirely. But uh, when we're talking five points, it just really isn't that important. Uh, one question that Pelissa was asking around, um, in terms of the, the rules based, I mean, I mean you, you've pulled those percentages, X percentage here, X, Y percentage there. Is, is that based on, on you know, where do those numbers come from? You're saying 40 percent to um, that or 20 here. Yeah. Where are you grabbing those you numbers know, but from? It is much more art than it is science. If you ask Michelangelo <laughs> how did he decide exactly what shade of color he's going to use for that painting, no, he would also not have been able to say, say to you. That's why I also refer to it as an initial portfolio design. So I want to encourage you, don't go into analysis paralysis. Don't go and overemphasize sort of this. Do that initial design ballpark sort of figures. Then go and look at what you have at the moment. For example, if I did my initial exercise, and let's say, for example, that the property, the direct property component that I had there came out at 50% of my current portfolio, then I probably would have needed to go and adjust my portfolio design because I'm just so far removed away from that and I'm going to sell the property. So now I've got to adjust some other numbers. So you can fine tune it. Um, it is, it's, it's not a, a, an exact science. This is a, all I can say in general is that the longer your time horizon, the more your capacity to go for higher risk, which means more equity, more property, more emerging market, more possibly things like physical commodities. The shorter your time horizon, the less risk you want, the more income components, the more you're going to be looking at interest bearing, the more cash you're going to hold, the more you want to have things like dividend sort of exposures in your portfolio. So those are probably the, the best ballpark sort of um, guidelines that I can give you. But don't be afraid to play, you know, start somewhere and, 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 and change this. This is not this is not cast in stone, and as I say, it's not it's not science. It's a lot more art than anything else. And as you say, as you say, play a million investment professionals around the world sort of quiver. But I agree with you. This needs to be fun, otherwise we're never going to do it. We, we've hit time, but I got a last question from Alfred because I, I I I'd like his question. He says, "I'm in my twenties with a hundred percent in equities. Why are you against the strategy if he's got 30, 40 years time horizon in the market?" Because I would love to see some diversification in that portfolio, Alfred. So I certainly would add some, some physical commodities in there because trust me, that's not a low risk strategy, but it's a wonderful diversifier. And Alfred, then I'd like you to keep some cash in there just for opportunity sake. Even if it's just 5%, you know what, it's, there's nothing worse than when an opportunity comes along and you don't have the cash to actually make use of that opportunity. So um, that's why on equities, I said, you know what, you can easily go as much as 80%. And yes, certainly when you start out, when you do your first investment and you're only buying one ETF, yeah, it is going to be an equity ETF. And then 100% of your portfolio will be in that. Bear in mind also that the design that we're doing is, is our target. It's our desire. It's where we want to be not where we are today. And that's where you then get that mind the gap that says, where should I be going to in terms of what I'm doing further? But Alfred, being in your 20s and starting out investing, I just want to say, you can do no wrong. Just go for it. <laughs> yeah, Alfred, you, you, you're winning already. And I, I agree with Narina. My grandfather always taught me, and he always said, you know, you, you got to have some cash. Of course, for him, that meant literally having money in his back pocket. But that's because he was he was born in the previous previous century 1890 something or other um a question coming anonymous uh Nirina, your inspiration to both herself and her seven-year-old daughter yeah can't argue with that at all what percentage of income should be allocated i truthfully more is better but always be careful with it you know we can get too extreme we can save 90 percent of our money and live like paupers and retire rich but then we don't have a life and you know the inside the inverse is where we spend everything and we we we, we, we live a great life but we 
have a horrid retirement. More is better, uh, but but we need to find that balance. There needs to be a, a life to live as well. Uh, and tons more questions, but we've hit the time. Uh, people have got dinners and families, uh, and uh, we have recorded. It will be online later this evening. There will be an email sent out. Uh, it'll include the PowerPoint, which I'll put into PDF. Irina will send us a blank version and all the contact details. You've got more questions, there's emails, there's uh, Twitters, et cetera. More than happy with that. Irina, really, really appreciate the time. Always the best having you present for us. Uh, and ladies and gents, really appreciate your time uh, giving up your, your, your Thursday evening. Two weeks time, uh, we've got Outfest. They've got a robo service and they're going to be delving into the, the sort of the back end of robo. They're taking a slightly different approach to Irina in that they've gone back with 100 years of data and they've crunched all of that data so we can get to see sort of how it all works from the from the, in the back end of a, of a robo uh, but everyone uh, stay safe wear your masks and uh, everyone uh, thank you very very much for your time Narina, absolutely brilliant thank you thanks guys have a good evening stay safe and stay well bye <laughs>